Most of us know the story of Faust, a fictional character from German literature who was greatly dissatisfied with his life. So he makes an agreement with Mistopheles, the lead lieutenant in Satan's army, to exchange his eternal soul for unlimited temporal knowledge and worldly pleasures. The story of Faust has become the basis for many literary, artistic, cinematic, and musical works. Each time you see a character who is portrayed as making a deal with the devil to reap personal goals and gains, it is called a Faustian bargain. They have sacrificed their integrity. They have sacrificed their worth and value to gain something from the devil. Wealth or fame or power or knowledge or as in one episode of The Simpsons, a really good donut. Today I'd like for us to consider how prone we are to the temptation to engage in a Faustian bargain, especially when we do not fully accept the sufficiency of Christ, crucifixion, and resurrection as our only reliable source for living. We live in an era that one person has called the age of the bargain, where people believe everything has a price. Everything is for sale. Everyone has a price. Everyone is for sale. Did you hear the story about the fundamentalist Baptist college that accepted huge amounts of financial resources from Budweiser in exchange for advertising in the school's sports arena and athletic fields? We wonder when it will all end. I have this fear that one day I'm going to be driving down the road and look over in front of a church and see the sign that says the Coors Light Baptist Church. In Romans 6, Paul writes about the forces that want to enslave us to sin, to ensnare us to death. Then he writes, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have now been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now that is strange talk. Paul says that we are set free from slavery in order to become slaves again. We are set free from slavery to sin in order to become slaves to righteousness. How can that be? How can it be that Christ gives us the freedom to become a slave? Doesn't slavery mean the absence of freedom? He was a wealthy Louisville surgeon. I was a young seminary student. I had been hired to house sit for the man while he and his family vacationed overseas. He was giving me a tour of the house and as he did he said, freedom. That's why I'm so proud to be an American. I have been on every continent on the globe and have visited 15 different countries. And I can tell you how incredibly blessed we are to live in a land of freedom. Then he showed me how to lock up for the evening. There were two locks and a chain on each of the five doors to the house. And once all of those locks and chains were secured, I would go to the master bedroom and I would punch in an activation code that would enable the security system. And once it was engaged, I would be unable to leave the master bedroom without engaging the motion sensitive alarms and automatically contacting the Louisville Police Department. Freedom, he said. That's why I'm proud to be an American. Is it really freedom? When you're locked inside your room, surrounded by more than a dozen locks and chains and alarms. I know I'm treading on dangerous ground. We're a culture that values freedom more than anything else, or at least we value what appears to be freedom. And if you mess with what we assume to be our freedom, we can get rather militant about it. Who are you to tell me what I'm supposed to do? You hear it not only from little children, but from grown-ups. 
More and more, we are a culture that defines the highest good as being free from anything that constrains us. Freedom from tradition, authority, government, religion, and so forth. More and more, the freedom of the individual is the highest thing we value in society. So when I speak of slavery, when I quote Paul's words about slavery leading to freedom, there's probably some disconnect in our thoughts. We know that slavery leads to captivity and despair and death. Slavery is when one person owns another person. We know that. This is Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. We once in this city housed the largest slave trading hub, second only to the one in New Orleans. Let's add to that thought. We're not far removed from a time in our nation when women were considered the property first of their father and then of their husband. Unless we be fooled into thinking that slavery doesn't exist today, there is a multi-billion dollar business on the underside of society that traffics in young children as sex slaves and immigrants as slave labor. So we know a little bit about slavery, historically, ancestrally, and culturally. We know that it doesn't sound like a very good thing. We know that it leads towards death. That being the case, we're shocked to hear Paul say that there is a slavery that leads to freedom in life. In fact, some Bible translators were so uncomfortable with this concept of slavery that they used the more politically correct word servant to avoid all of the bad implications of slavery. But the word that Paul uses from the Greek is best translated slave, not servant. He is saying that through the cross and the empty tomb, we have been enslaved to Christ. We have become enslaved to righteousness. Let me help you wrap your minds around what Paul is saying. I want you to think back to the day of your baptism. I know for some that's going to be thinking back a little further than for others. Remember when the pastor said something like, Buried with him in baptism unto death. Raised to walk in new life with him. What if right after that, when you came out of the water, if the pastor had said something like this, friends, allow me to introduce to you the newest slave of Jesus Christ. Let's all rejoice and give thanks for the tremendous freedom that this person will experience now that they are enslaved to the Lord Jesus as their master. It doesn't sound right, yet it is right. That's what Paul's teaching. You were baptized, baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. Through baptism, the chains of death were removed and the chains of resurrection now bind you. You have been chained to Jesus Christ and you are now his slave for life. Let's get this into our minds. Christ is now your master. God owns you. Your boss is not the master of your life. No government official is the master of your life. Men are no longer the masters over women. Neither are women to dominate men. No member of the clergy is your ruler. You're not even your own master. You don't determine your own destiny. You belong to Christ. You're his. Paul says that it is through this slavery to Christ that we become truly free. Liberty comes through slavery, he says. How's that possible? Well, as slaves to Christ, we have a master who will not sell us out. Other masters will do that. As slaves to Christ, we have a master who will not abandon us, who will set us free from the path of death and destruction. As slaves to Christ, we are chained to a master who desires for us wholeness and fullness of life. The boss will betray you. Your spouse will betray you. The government will betray you. Your best friend will betray you. Some member of the clergy will betray you. You may even betray yourself, but Jesus will never betray you. At some point, you have or will be betrayed by every master of the world who vies for control over your life. 
And whenever you make a contract with the devil, you'll always end up losing at the end of the deal. Through the waters of baptism, the symbol of our salvation, we enter into Christ's death with him. And through the waters of baptism, we throw off the chains of bondage to the world and to sin and to all of its masters. And we take up the chains of the resurrection, chains that lead to eternal life. As we understand that we are chained to Jesus and the power of his resurrection for all eternity, it will lead us away from all sorts of Faustian bargains. We know that we belong to the Father through Christ's redemption. We know that that makes all the difference in the world, not just for the great by and by, but for the great here and now as well. Have you ever, have you ever encountered someone who tried to demean you and make you feel like you were worthless? Have you ever been in a relationship with someone who left you feeling like you were damaged goods? Have you ever had a parent or a spouse or a child humiliate you, insult you, and put you down? Have you ever had a preacher stand in a pulpit and tell you you were useless of no account and had no value to offer? Have you, ever, have you ever heard that voice that's inside of your head that comes to you in the middle of the night when you can't sleep and are feeling insecure and tells you that you are insignificant, that you are unimportant, that you are irrelevant? You don't have to listen to those lies anymore. Those voices are not your master. You don't have to see yourself that way anymore. You can move away from that attitude of defeat and resignation. You can move towards confidence and expectation. Listen, when we feel weak, insignificant, incomplete, not enough, and worthless, we become prime targets for Mistopheles and his invitations to come on down, let's make a deal. Ultimately, this is the root of all temptation. We think we are not good enough, smart enough, sharp enough, nice enough. We feel broken down and worthless of no value with no purpose. But the truth is that in Christ we have all that we need to be all that we've been called to be. We are now in Christ as his slaves set free to live with passion and power and purpose because we are bound up in him. I gave you an insert in your worship bulletin this morning. You've probably seen this. I think I've shared it with you in one form or another. I want to share with you just a few of these things. I want you to take it and use this as a devotional guide, if you will. First column says, I am God's. One of the verses there is God's friend. Have you ever felt that you were lonely, that you had no one you could call on and no one you could talk to, that everyone was letting you down? You have in God a friend you can rely on. I have, right down the middle of that column, a hope that is sure and steadfast. That's the kind of hope I want, not one that is just something that is, is fluff that comes up in my mind, but one that is solid and sure because it is rooted in God's love and God's grace. And when it's rooted in Him, it is steadfast and sure. I can come boldly to His throne, one of them says. That's not kind of arrogance walking in and like a, a, a bull in a china shop, but it is on the awareness that the one who sits on the throne is one who loves us and accepts us and includes us and adopts us. I cannot be taken out of the Father's hand, it also says in one of the columns. When the Father holds you, he holds you forever. 
I have been down towards the bottom of that section given the ministry of reconciliation. We so often think that the ministry we engage in is our gift to God, but the ministry we engage in is God's gift to us. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of sharing with the world good news in words and deeds, the ministry of letting people know that the work that God has done through Jesus the Son and the power of the Spirit reconciles us to Him and reconciles us to one another. And then the very first one under I am in Colossians 2.10, it speaks of us being complete in Him. I am complete in Him. How many nights I've spent thinking I'm not enough. I don't have what I need. Not feeling like I had all that I needed to have to be what God's called me to be. But in Christ, slave to Him, you and I are complete. There's nothing more that we need to be what God's called us to be and do what God's called us to do than what God has given us through Christ. I am complete. Here's the one and only secret to living the successful Christian life. Know to whom you belong. You belong to God who was willing to enter into human history in Jesus Christ the Son in order to take all of the mess of our humanity into himself, all of our brokenness, all of our sin, all of those feelings of alienation. He took all of that into himself and put it to death on the cross. And what was born on the day of resurrection is now ours. He is our resurrection and life. We belong to God in Christ Jesus who's redeemed us from all of that and given us grace. Christ gave all of himself, every bit of it, for you. Christ gave all of himself to you. There is nothing more that you or we need than Christ. The foundation of Paul's ethics is this. Know who you are and live like who you are. It is still Easter. Every Sunday is. What if Easter really does make all the difference in the world? What if the resurrection of Jesus really does change us at the core of who we are, change our identity? What if Christianity isn't really some sort of self-improvement plan or program, but it is God making us over from scratch in Christ? What if everything we need is already ours through our connection to Christ? What if Jesus really is enough? If Jesus is really enough, then we have enough because Jesus has given himself to us. And if we believe it so, then no Faustian bargain would ever be appealing to us. We would never think that we don't have enough because we would know that Jesus is always more than enough. That's why Paul writes, you were dead to sin, or you are dead to sin, and you are alive to God through Christ. You are no longer slaves to sin. You are now a slave to righteousness. You have been freed from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit is that you reap a life of holiness. The result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God that we have through Jesus Christ, the gift of God is eternal life. Dear friends, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I challenge you today Know who you are. Know to whom you belong. And live like you are a slave to righteousness. Because that leads to freedom and life. Amen.